This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Democratic presidential candidates will face off in Las Vegas Wednesday night, ahead of the Nevada caucuses. It's the first debate with billionaire Michael Bloomberg on the stage, and Nevada could be a decisive state for candidates who perform poorly in Iowa and New Hampshire, including former Vice President Joe Biden. As Biden hopes for a comeback, a new short documentary sheds light on his extensive role advocating for the Iraq War, an issue that's been raised repeatedly on the campaign trail. Biden has apologized for supporting the war, but today, in a broadcast exclusive, we're going to bring you a new film directed by the Center for Economic and Policy Research's Mike Weisbrot that exposes Biden's central role in pushing for an Iraq invasion. It's called Worth the Price, Joe Biden and the Launch of the Iraq War. The documentary is narrated by Danny Glover. But before we go to it, we're going to uh, the director himself, Mark Weisbrot, to talk as we go back in time some 16, 17 years, Mark. Just give us a little introduction to why you decided to make this film now about the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Yes. Well, first, you know, a lot of people think he's going to lose and maybe it doesn't matter, but he is still in the race. And he, even if he loses, and I, I think he probably will, he's still going to, he still could very easily play a role if there's a brokered convention, which you talked about on this show. He could play a role in the decision of who the candidate is. And I think that's one of the reasons he's staying in the race, trying to get through Super Tuesday and, and so on. But the second thing is, this is vitally important. And it really hasn't been discussed on, on television. And I want to thank you for having this show, uh, you, you've had his vote uh, for the Iraq war has been brought up, uh, but there's never been a presentation of what he actually did, which was he was the most important elected official in this country after George W. Bush and, and Dick Cheney in enabling and uh, allowing and, and getting the authorization for the war uh, through Congress. That was a huge role in bringing us this war. It wasn't just a vote for the war. He was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. As we turn now to the new documentary short, Worth the Price, Joe Biden and the Launch of the Iraq War, it's narrated by Danny Glover. Our American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. The costs of the Iraq war were enormous. More than 4,500 American soldiers, as well as thousands of military contractors, were killed. Tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers were wounded. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, and by some estimates, more than a million were killed. And the war created massive instability, including more wars and terrorism throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Fast forward to the 2020 presidential race. There's only one candidate for the nomination of the Democratic Party who played a leading role in actually making the Iraq war happen. In my judgment, President Bush is right to be concerned about Saddam Hussein's relentless pursuit of weapons of mass destruction and the possibility that he may use them or share them with terrorists. Other regimes hostile to the United States and our allies already have or seek to acquire weapons of mass destruction. This was Joe Biden in 2002, speaking as chair of the United States Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. A few months later, when the Senate was debating whether to give President George W. Bush the authority to start a war with Iraq. Biden argues strongly in favor of granting this authority. The objective is to compel Iraq to destroy its illegal weapons of mass destruction and its program to develop and produce missiles and more of those weapons. Saddam is dangerous. The world would be a better place without him. But the reason he poses a growing danger to the United States and its allies is that he possesses chemical and biological weapons and is seeking nuclear weapons. And unlike uh, my uh, 
my colleague from West Virginia and Maryland, I do not believe this is a rush to war. I believe it's a march to peace and security. I believe that failure to overwhelmingly support this resolution is likely to enhance the prospects that war will occur. Joe Biden did so much more than vote for the war. Um, he was the chair of the powerful Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and he really used his control over that committee to make sure that a majority of the U.S. Senate voted to authorize the war. And that, that's a very serious thing. Historian Barbara Ransby. Uh, it's questionable whether the, the authorization to start the war could have even passed Congress without all that Biden did to get it approved. So he really did play a major role um, in bringing us into the Iraq war, a terrible, terrible war. And this was much more responsibility. Um, he, he bears much more responsibility uh, than many other senators who simply voted for it. Of course, the statement about chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons were false. Uh, and many experts already concluded this at the time of the Senate hearings, but Biden didn't allow these experts to testify. That's really significant. Um, as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, Biden was able to control the Senate debate on the war, and therefore much of the information that most senators received and that major media outlets uh, reported uh, was, was really distorted. There were other Democrats in the Senate who wanted to put limits on Bush's ability to start a war in Iraq. For example, if there was no imminent threat to the United States and the United Nations did not authorize a war, then President Bush would have to come back to Congress for another resolution. But Biden shot this down. So the reason why I oppose the amendment of my friend from Michigan is because the basic premise upon which I began is consistent with where my friend from, from Connecticut begins, and that is that the threat need not be imminent for us to take action. That's authority we're about to delegate to the president. So the fact that he would take such a stridently pro-war position, that he would use that role uh, to uh, limit the debate the way he did, played a major factor in getting the enough defections from the uh, Democratic majority to join with almost unanimous Republican support to make the war resolution pass. Professor Steven Zunas. As a result, I don't think it would be unfair to say that Biden played a more important role than probably anybody in Congress in making the Iraq war possible. The idea that Iraq, uh, which had been rid of its uh, non-conventional weapons and weapons programs and weapons systems that was under the strictest sanctions of any na nation has ever experienced, was somehow a threat to the United States and the far side of the world is totally absurd. I mean, totally ridiculous. I mean, the fact that an educated person like Joe Biden with foreign policy experience would believe that uh, it really defies the imagination. But the witnesses mostly reinforced the pro-war arguments. The question before us really is, should the United States depose Saddam Hussein? And my answer is clearly yes. But my suggestion, as I stated earlier, is that regime change, as the stated U.S. policy, would be the correct uh, way to deal with this problem. In my opinion, weapons inspections are not the answer to the real problem, which is the regime. And the people want a regime change. Let's help them to make this change and liberate Iraq from this oppressor. Iraq has enough to generate the needed bomb-grade uranium for three nuclear weapons by 2005. It is too difficult to see how any measure short of a regime change will be effective. A nuclear-armed Saddam sometime in this decade is a risk we cannot choose to ignore. It is essential to recognize that the claim made by Saddam's representatives that Iraq has no weapons of mass destruction is false. We know that the Iraq present, permits no al-Qaeda members to live and move freely about in Iraq. Uh, I am told that that is, uh, uh, that that is the case, that the al-Qaeda groups are welcome uh, and that they're being uh, uh, supported, uh, their families are being supported. I have to tell you, Iraqis desperately want to be freed of Saddam Hussein, and they also know that the only country that can help them with this is the United States. And they are ready to welcome the U.S. as liberators. Has worked. Senator Lincoln Chafee of Rhode Island pushed back against the witnesses being stacked, but Biden cut him off. 
And I do think that uh, it would have been good to have that perspective on this panel uh, that uh, for a better balance. I think we've got uh, from this panel uh, a perspective that the threat is very real, very immediate, and I, I, I maybe would ask you to comment on uh, some of these senior military officials, including, according to the article, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and their Senator Yield, you know, just for a moment, uh, I apologize, but uh, excuse me. Um, the senator uh, from Florida is going to chair the hearing. I have to uh, I'll leave for a few minutes, um, and after this panel is over, we'll recess for uh, um, how much time for lunch? 45 minutes for lunch when this panel, I'm not suggesting we f finish now, but when the panel is finished, we'll recess for 45 minutes. And, uh, and I assure you, uh, Senator, there are other witnesses coming along who think the policy containment is just fine. So I hope you'll find this is extremely balanced when, you're f when we finish the whole two days of hearings. But uh, I, I thank you for your, uh, letting me interrupt and I turning the gavel over. Biden never returned to the problem that Senator Chafee raised about the bias of the witnesses that were allowed to testify. Matthew Ho. I was in the Iraq war twice and in the Afghan war once. You know, for veterans, these wars have had an impact that lasts for our whole lives. Uh, the Iraq war, almost 4,600 American soldiers were killed there. I think as of, uh, as of this, uh, as of the first month of 2020, I think that the total number is 45, 75. Um, the, and that's just the direct number killed because, so, because war has been privatized and contracted out and companies are making money off of it. The estimates are that a similar number, about 4,500 contractors, men and women who were doing jobs in the military that in past wars soldiers would have been doing, were also killed in Iraq. So when you look at the number killed, you have to look at, say, 9,000 rather than almost than 4,500. That does not take into account the suicides. The suicides from these wars, based upon Veterans Administration data, runs between 9,000 and 10,000 killed by suicide. We've also had, uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands of men and women wounded in action. I had Marines in my command who were hit by roadside bombs nine, ten times during a deployment. This is why I think so many of us who were in these wars are so disgusted by the political system, so, so upset and furious that people who were responsible for these wars, who, who had a, a, a constitutional responsibility for oversight, just went along with the group thing, just got rid of, of any uh, 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 intellectual honesty or moral honesty. President Barack Obama. Uh, ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al Qaeda in Iraq mm -hmm. that grew out of our invasion, which is an example of unintended consequences, which is why we should generally aim before we shoot. Stephen Kinzer. Decapitated the government there, left no indigenous leadership, and that not only allowed all sorts of groups within Iraq to revolt against what they saw as an illegitimate occupier, but it attracted jihadist fanatics from around the world. They looked at Iraq and saw, here's the place where we can go kill American soldiers, and they poured in. There they are gaining experience for future wars. So without the sin of the Iraq invasion, we wouldn't be dealing with ISIS today. Vincent Canestraro. First time in my 27 years, in intelligence, the first time I have ever heard of a vice president of the United States going out to CIA and sitting down with desk level analysts, it's sitting down and debating with junior level analysts uh, and pushing them to find support for something he personally believes that uh, Saddam was trying to acquire uranium. That to me is pressure and that's intimidation. And they're not going to say, well, Mr. Vice President, you're full of Lawrence Wilkerson. Manufacturing the case in the bowels of the CIA for Saddam Hussein's possession of weapons of mass destruction. And in the United States Congress. One of the false stories that the Bush administration used to promote the war with Iraq was that Saddam Hussein was actually connected with al-Qaeda 
the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks. President George W. Bush. Oh, the reason I keep insisting that uh, there was a relationship between Iraq and Saddam and Al-Qaeda because there was a relationship between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was included in the resolution that Biden pushed through the Senate which gave Bush the authority to go to war. Stephen Kinzer. Anybody who had the slightest knowledge about that region would realize the absurdity of the connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda, who actually were bitter enemies. I was in Iraq when Saddam Hussein was in power. Saddam did not tolerate any form of religious extremism. If you were sitting in a cafe and you said to the person next to you, our government really isn't religious enough. We should have more piety from our leaders and in our policies. You'd probably be arrested within an hour. There was no chance of Al-Qaeda or any kind of religious extremist group from getting a foothold in Iraq while Saddam Hussein was in power. After Bush invaded, Biden continued to support the war for years. Some of my own party have said that it was a mistake to go to Iraq in the first place and believe that it's not worth the cost, whatever benefit may flow from our engagement in Iraq. But the cost of not acting against Saddam, I think, would have been much greater. And so is the cost, and so will be the cost, of not finishing this job. The President of the United States is a bold leader and he is popular. The stakes are high and the need for leadership is great. I wish he'd use some of his stored up popularity to make what I admit is not a very popular case. But I and many others will support him. Nine months ago, I voted with my colleagues to give the President of the United States of America the authority to use force and I would vote that way again today. It was a right vote then, and it'd be a correct vote today. Lawrence Wilkerson. And President Obama in the Roosevelt Room essentially told me this. September the 10th, 2015, he started off the conversation with these words. There's a bias in this town toward war. I almost fell off my seat. And then he told us for the next 20, 25 minutes that he didn't know what to do about it. There's a bias in this town toward war, said the President of the United States. We have a machine in Washington. It consists of predatory capitalists like Lockheed Martin and ExxonMobil and all they represent. ExxonMobil sells more fossil fuel to DOD than any other entity in the world. Lockheed Martin, the biggest weapons merchant in the world, makes a fortune off war. So does Raytheon, Grumman, and Boeing. As long as you have these dollars rolling in, you're going to have constant endless war. Professor Adam Gitachi. In the United States, Biden represents a kind of a long-standing bipartisan uh, commitment to U.S. preeminence on the global stage, in which the U.S. acts as the policeman of the world. I think a lot of Americans are frustrated by this position. They want to have a different kind of relationship to the world, and they want a leader, a president, and a Congress that can present a vision of prosperity for all Americans. I think that only happens when we break with this cycle of endless wars. It is going to be very difficult, I think, for a Democratic Party candidate who basically reiterates the status quo of endless military interventions, endless wars in the Middle East, to win against Donald Trump. Dick Durbin. At the time of this debate, I was a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And I would read the headlines in the paper in the morning, and I'd watch the television newscast, and I'd shake my head. Because you see, just a few hundred feet away from here, in a closed room, carefully guarded, the Intelligence Committee was meeting on a daily basis for top secret briefings about the information we were receiving, and the information we had in the Intelligence Committee was not the same information being given to the American people. I couldn't believe President it. President George W. Facing Bush. clear evidence of peril. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Senator Dick Durbin. So what happened? We invaded, turned loose, hundreds if not thousands of people scouring Iraq for these weapons of mass destruction, never found one of them. Looked for nuclear weapons, no evidence whatsoever went into our intelligence files and said, okay, Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda, let's get this linkage put together once and for all. No evidence at all of a linkage. The American people were deceived into this war. Matthew Ho. I tell you what, 
I don't understand how any of these politicians who claim to support the troops and support their families, I don't understand how anyone could hold a mother at the funeral of her son who just turned 20, who was killed either in the wars or because of suicide, and I've done both, and there's no difference for the mother, and act as if somehow there's some benefit to these wars, when it's demonstrably not. You know, and then you're over there, and you're fighting in it, and you're, you're taking part in it. And, you know, as an officer, I was responsible for my Marines and for my sailors and for I had their lives and I was responsible to their families for that. And you do, you think, can I go home and say to the families that it was worth it, that their son was killed, their husband was killed, their brother was killed for something that was good or something that was beneficial. Senator Joe I Biden. At the outset, if we can make the case, which I think, well, I won't say what I think yet, the hearings aren't finished, but if we can make the case, that the threat is real and dire, that a free and democratic Iraq, if it could be accomplished, could have a cleansing impact on that part of the world and make our life easier significantly down the road, which I think could be made in an ideal circumstance, not even an ideal, in a, if we do things right, um, that it is worth the price. That's the broadcast exclusive of Worth the Price, Joe Biden and the launch of the Iraq War. It's narrated by Danny Glover, directed by Mark Weisbrot with the Center for Economic and Policy Research, who is joining us from Washington, D.C. So, in these last two minutes, we have Mark. Now, again, on the campaign trail, uh, presidential candidate Biden has said, in one form or another, he made a mistake on Iraq. Your response? Well, I think that's just too little and too late. It's not enough. You know, this really has to be an issue. You can't—this can't be swept under the rug. And we're entering a different period right now, I think, is very crucial. We could have another war even before the election. You had uh, President Trump come very close to a war with Iran uh, when he ordered the assassination of General Soleimani and, uh, just a month ago. And this is something that also—the other part of it, on the, on the positive side, there's enormous resistance to this in Congress. You have. Uh, Bernie Sanders, for instance, introduced the uh, No War with Iran Act, and he also led uh, the fight, which was successful, to get both houses of Congress. And this was using the War Powers Resolution for the first time in 45 years. Both houses of Congress voted to order the U.S. military to get out of this war in Yemen, which has killed hundreds of thousands of people. So there's a real strong uh, movement now to put an end to these endless wars. And these wars will go on forever if we don't allow this to even be discussed. We have to have this discussion. This is somebody who's running for president of the United States, and he played a major role in uh, bringing about this war that killed, uh, you know, by the best estimates, a million people and uh, thousands of U.S., uh, over 4,500 U.S. soldiers. And here it is, it has, his role hasn't even been discussed. At the very least, people voting in the Democratic primary should know what he did. Interestingly, Mark Weisbrot, The Los Angeles Times recently had a piece. Um, here you have Joe Biden apologizing for what he did, and you really lay out clearly how he was not only supporting the war, but leading the support. Um, Mayor Bloomberg, when interviewed by The Los Angeles Times, uh, said he didn't regret backing the Iraq War back then. Yes, that's another reason. I mean, because it's Bloomberg too. So this is an issue in the in the race. And you know, this is even bigger than that because for you know the last fifty years, the peace movement has always pointed out that when you build a, a fighter plane, you're giving up on health care for thousands of people. But it's even worse than that now because now the you know the intellectuals of the so-called national seconds. security state are well. They're talking about an arms race with China. You could forget about the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and everything else. Because that their economy is already 30 percent bigger than ours, and is going to be twice as big within 10 years. So this affects everything that anybody who cares about this presidential election wants. 
Mark Weisbrot, I want to thank you for being with us, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. That does it for our show. I'll be speaking at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana, Wednesday night at 6, moderating a panel with Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, Arun Gandhi, Archbishop Desmond Tutu's daughter, Reverend Naomi Tutu, President Reagan's son, Ronald Reagan Jr., Reza Aslan, and more. Check out democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. This is Democracy Now!